All right, this uh, evening we'll be looking at Psalm 128, Psalm 128, and we'll read these six verses here and uh, hope to, from that, uh, establish a thought and then uh, go through some different spots in the scriptures to find some Bible principles um, <clears throat> about a Psalm 128 home. A Psalm 128 home. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask God that you would bless this time again as we open your word. And we're grateful, Lord, that we have it. We're thankful, Lord, that we can come to the scriptures, Lord, and get a foundation. Lord, get something that we have as an absolute truth. Lord, as we seek through the course of this life to, in our homes, Make them a place where um, it's godly and it's reverent and it's uh, pleasing to you. And Lord, where eternity is the main thing um, that dominates uh, the spirit of the house. And Lord, I pray that you would be with each of our families, God. We all need your wisdom and your guidance, Lord. We always uh, never want to be done learning. And uh Lord, we're just thankful that we can use your Bible as our handbook, our guidebook, and we can, we can rest on it. So, Lord, I pray you bless our time here this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So, a Psalm 128 home, uh, let's begin by reading, um, uh, I'll begin by reading, I should say, these, uh, these six verses. Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways, for thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall uh, the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. I find it interesting here that there's, in this passage, there is the husband referenced in verse 3 when it speaks of his wife, thy wife, speaking of the husband here, the wife is spoken of. Children are spoken of in verse 3. Grandchildren are spoken of in verse 6. And then everyone is spoken of in the first two verses. Let's look at those first two verses again. Blessed, that just means very, very happy and content, peaceful. Is everyone that feareth the Lord, that's a mindset, but also that walketh in his ways, that's an action. So it's one thing to fear the Lord and assent to that mentally. It's another thing to walk in the, as we just sang, the footsteps of Jesus. So it's a mind and an action. That's a happy, very content, peaceful person. Number two is a, is a blessing and a warning, I guess I would say, where the Bible says, thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Now, depending on what the labor of our hands has been, that can be a blessing or that can be a warning. And in our home, we can eat the labor of our hands. We will reap what we sow. We will be living off of what we have done in our Christian lives, in our homes. We will. And that's an opportunity, we could certainly say. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So there's instructions for everyone. There's instructions for the husband. There is a description of a wife and children in this Psalm 128 home, and even the blessing that comes from grandchildren. And so in our lesson tonight, uh, I'd like to look at, in addition to this passage, uh, 17 uh, points, uh, principles of Scripture about making a Psalm 128 home or striving for a Psalm 128 home. 
Rearing a family ought to be a thing of joy. It could be something that uh, brings great happiness um, in, in a home. And so, um, but we do understand uh, that God has given us uh, some things to pray for and some things to work on and strive toward uh, in this uh, effort uh, and in this blessing of the Christian home. So here's some principles for this home from the scriptures. Number one. Determined to use God's word instead of worldly counsel in our homes. Now, this would apply to um, uh, our husband and wife relationship as well as our child rearing. The world cannot now, nor has it ever been able to tell us how to raise a godly son or daughter. For one thing, there's no more just sons and daughters in this world. There's a mix, and there's transitions, and the world has lost, and our country has lost even the ability to discern and to determine the difference between boys and girls, how basic that is. That goes at the very heart of our creator. So if we're looking to raise godly um, boys and girls in our home, we need to understand that the world will never be able to be our counselor, but they'll try. And then sometimes when they try, what they try, they come through, uh, their, their advice sometimes comes through so-called Christians or internet counselors or uh, somebody who you're going to read their book because if you look on the back of the book, they went to all these different counseling degrees, but now they're going to use the Bible and combine it with their counseling degrees. They're going to be even better than that old-fashioned preacher because what does he know? And so beware of this. You get a lot of uh, marriage, family advice from the Internet. Someone uh, recently posted this statement. I found it interesting. Think about it for a second. This is uh, from someone that uh, is, is uh, a lady offering um, advice for our homes. She said this, quote, You're only rebellious in the eyes of those who cannot manipulate you. So I didn't know if we were reading a quote from Absalom there. Uh, I do remember hearing about a song in the 80s by a, a real healthy group called Twisted Sister. They had a song called, We're Not Gonna Take It. So I didn't know which of the two was given that advice, whether I was reading Absalom or Twisted Sister. So I looked a little closer and actually found out that it's someone that was raised in a Christian home but now has gotten enlightened about how uh, wrong biblical standards are. And so they were manipulated. And so now their mantra, lining up with Absalom and Twisted Sister, is you're only rebellious in the eyes of those who can't manipulate you. And I'm really glad Jesus did not have that attitude in the Garden of Gethsemane. because every single person that ever lived would be in hell. He was the perfect man, and he was perfectly in submission to his father. And so that's just one tiny example of uh, a variety of advice that will roll across your screen roll across your mindset, it'll come through your ears from sometimes well-meaning people, okay? But let's just be real clear that the world or the world's ways, even if it comes through the mouthpiece of a Christian, uh, better line up with Scripture. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that is our foundation, period. If we are away from that, we are going to be in the storm with no sail and no rudder and end up on who knows where. So let's just really uh, clearly from the start understand that. Look at Hosea 8.12 here. Hosea 8.12. I'll give you 20 minutes because it's a minor prophet to get there. I'm singing the song in my head right now too. It's not too far into the, into the list. 
Hosea 8.12. It's tough, boy, for these prophets. These prophets, they were up there telling God's word, and man, very few people wanted to listen to them. Very few. They had a tough job. They'd still say it. They'd still give it. But here's Hosea. He says this, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing, a foreign thing. Not really familiar with them. That doesn't ring a bell. What a shame when we hear counsel that's against the Bible, we should be able to we should be able to see that because the scriptures aren't a strange thing to us personally or in our home. Now, there's a danger when scriptures do become not a big deal or not a part of our daily life or in our home. All of a sudden, all these other strange philosophies start to make sense. And they can only make sense when the scripture becomes a strange thing. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's stick with the truth that God's word is the foundation, not worldly counsel. Number two, don't consider children a burden or a robber of your time and pleasure. Don't consider children a burden or a robber of your time and pleasure. That will certainly come across to... Uh, <clears throat> Kids, we're either a kid now or we were once a kid, and we can remember that. We can remember whether someone was really paying attention or not. We could pretty soon, we could pretty much tell whether we were taking up someone's time or whether they really wanted to spend time uh, with us. So uh, uh, children will know that we feel this, and um, <clears throat> that, that can be okay. I mean, somebody may get away with that for a little bit, but really, especially as the, as the young, as the kids grow from elementary into their teenage years, um, there's going to be a real battle for their heart. There's going to become a real conflict for their attention and for where they're going to fit in at. And so to establish from the very start that children, they're not taking away our time and pleasure. They're a heritage from the Lord is what the Bible says. They're, they're a tremendous blessing. Okay. And if, if that's the way the home is structured, then that can, when they become teenagers, transfer over to them continuing to understand that when a real tug of war uh, often comes into a, a teenager's mind, can I get more satisfaction somewhere else? And uh, the devil will bring all kinds of things in. He'll, he'll bring the flesh in and the world, and the devil will really try to vie for the for the uh, interest and the, um, the um, love of, of our uh, children uh, as they grow into teenagers. So from the very start, it needs to be very clear that the, our children are not a burden. They're not robbing us of time uh, and pleasure. Uh, they are, again, a heritage from the Lord, according to Psalm 127, uh, verse 3. Not a burden, uh, not a robber of our time and pleasure. They're a heritage from the Lord. Number three, never make possessions more important than relationships. Never make possessions more important than relationships. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth away. And uh, we seek first the kingdom of God. And our treasure is uh, eternal things that don't rust and don't corrupt. So um, <clears throat> to, to treat uh, our homes uh, and our possessions... Uh, as more important than the time and the relationship uh, that God allows us to have uh, is, is going, to, going to backfire if we're trying to have uh, a Psalm 128 uh, home as well. Now, understand, we like to keep the house clean, and some moms are a little more picky about that than others. Uh, other moms are, you know, a kid's best, you know, a teenage boy's best friend. <laughs> They're like, yeah, whatever, leave your shoes on, you know, eat in the living room. You know, you spilled a two-liter, ah, that's fine, no big deal, the dog will lick it up. Uh, you know, you visited homes like that. Actually kind of fun to visit for a little bit, but I don't know if you really want to live there. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, you've also visited homes where, you know, you had to show your ID card before you walked in, get a retinal scan, and you had to be completely detoxed, and, you know, your shoes, socks, you know, left outside in, in the garage, and you transported in. And you, you could look, but you, could you can't touch. Can I sit on this couch? No, you can look can't touch. Can I eat? No, there could be crumbs. You're here. Okay, 
enjoy the time. What can I do? Not much. <laughs> Not much. So there's extremes on that, <clears throat> but we do need to understand that uh, possessions are more important. Uh, possessions are never more important uh, than, than relationships. What's nice to have in a home is, is joy. Okay. The latest couch or the nicest, the nicest furniture, it doesn't really matter if there's joy in a home. And we can sense that aroma pretty quick. If there's joy, joy is, uh, it, it, it spreads. And uh, it, it gives us actually uh, strength, spiritual strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so um, now, uh, a lot of things can steal joy. We know that. Joy can be stole by a, stolen by a, a, a child or a young person in the home that has a sour attitude. They can steal the joy from everybody in the home. They need to get that taken care of. Okay? Joy can be stolen by a parent who's um, uh, uh, under the circumstances, I guess you could say, instead of under you know, God's grace and under God's joy. So that can as well. Um, number four. Number four. Beware of comparing child to child or your spouse to some perfect spouse. In other words, beware of comparisons in the home. The Bible says comparing themselves with another are not wise. For a man to start in his mind, hopefully not in his words, but in his mind to compare his spouse to some other, quote, perfect spouse, uh, is going to be the, the destruction of a home. Okay, The perfect spouse is the one that God gave you. That is the perfect spouse. Um, and the children that God wanted you to have, he gave you. Okay? They're your kids. And especially when a parent would be unwise to say something like, why can't you be like so-and-so? Well, <clears throat> there's, there's better ways to correct a child than to use that. Okay? Uh, well, let's just say for sure, though, that our comparison for all of us should be toward to Jesus Christ and toward to the Scriptures. Um, but uh, particularly among the husband and wife, the comparison to someone others needs to be something that needs to be taken uh, to the Lord and confessed immediately and forsaken and forsaken the second that that thought comes into our mind. Okay. Number five, <laughs> don't make a federal case out of kids being children. Don't make a federal case out of kids being children. We are taking you to the magistrate you Dorito dropper, he is going to deal with you as he sees fit. They're kids, you know, they're, they're kids. So um, I, thankful my, generally my, my mom and dad had this down. Now I touched that last nerve that they're talking about these days a time or two. You know, so that's on me, uh, and they're human. So, you know, you get near the last nerve, all bets are off. Uh, but in general, I, I appreciate it, and I, I look back, and I'm grateful for parents like I'd be love to play, you know, baseball like front yard baseball with the with the guys in the neighborhood. And, you know, yeah, you, not every not every hits a, a grounder up the middle. Some are kind of like an angled pop fly into the would-be stands, also known as the front windows of the house. It's the same idea there, you know, those. We didn't have the fancy netting that they have today to protect everybody. So in the, yeah, I guess I would love to have seen my dad's exact reaction when he was sitting on the couch after a long day of work and he got a kind of a hard rubber ball rolling beside him through the window. Um, <clears throat> so we got to you know, give him a little breather, a little grace for the shock that he displayed to me. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it was this, okay? Th that, I was not saying, I'm going to swing a rebellious swing of this bat right now. I'm going to use the Absalom bat. I'm pulling it up right here. This bat is known as the rebel. Every time you swing with this bat, it goes through a window. I didn't pick that bat. I didn't even have that bat. I mean, think they make that bat. But <clears throat> that's what happened. And so they saw the difference between me doing an activity 
me being a rebel as a child and me being a child as a child. So I still had to take my dip into my wealth of savings as a seven-year-old. <laughs> I have no idea where, I don't know. I just pray and grandma remembered my birthday and <laughs> she did something beside, well, you're five now, you get $5. Like, can you, can you raise that up a little bit? I got this window to replace. And, hey, grandma, birthday's coming up here and dropping those kid hints. Anyway, I think that's my only source of income for quite a while. But anyway, it got depleted because, okay, you, yeah, it was a mistake, but you broke that, so you can pay for that. Okay, you can pay for you can pay you can pay for that, or pay for part of it. I mean, I guess there's there's limits on what you're actually breaking. You, uh, okay, sell me as a slave. I don't know why I don't have that money. <laughs> uh, see you later. Uh, but um, th there's a th the big distinction that we all could do well to make as parents is a child being a child and a child being a rebel. Maybe dealt with differently. Uh, there. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, even Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. Okay, <clears throat> so we should be aware of that too with regard to their attention spans. Okay, I've fallen prey to this way too many times. Got eloquent in family devotions in the summer where there wasn't like a, you know, a certain time to be here and I'm rolling into 45 smooth minutes laying the doctrine out. I was wide awake, pretty sure my wife was, though there's questions about that even, but my kids weren't. But I was right there. Okay, so the attention span's different as a kid. Gotta understand that and tell them fun stories <laughs> every now and again. Number six, be aware of Threatening constantly, but disciplinely, disciplining uh, inconsistently. Just be aware, beware of threatening or saying, I expect you to do this, and then not doing it. Now, it's simple, but that's maybe the hardest work for any of us in here to do. Because, okay, you know, tomorrow morning, I expect you to have the bathroom cleaned. Well... We have to inspect what we expect, and then what, what, when we ins, inspect it, and it's not what we expect, then what? <sighs> Here we go. But that simple thing really is key to, to, to a home, is if we just are all threats, we're all just words, it's all just, oh, well, oh, well. In the kid's mind, they just, they don't really mean what they say. They say a lot, but they don't really mean a lot because they don't check. Should we have to check? Well, in a perfect world, no, but until, uh, you know, the 1,000-year rain starts, it ain't going to be a perfect world. So we're going to be, in fact, God's still inspecting you and me, whatever our age is too, isn't he? And does he always say, whoo, perfection, just as I found the last year from you. Good job there, saint. No, there's a lot of inspection that he does for me too. Ooh, ooh. So... Um, but when training and, and raising our kids, we have to be aware, beware of just threatening and saying this deadline or this expectation and not, and then not, uh, following through with it and appropriate discipline as a result or, you know, encouragement, uh, for, uh, that, that was done good. Number seven. Beware of belittling children or spouses, okay? Now, <clears throat> there's a, I, I think there is a balance that we can come to on this, okay? What we're not saying is the, you know, uh, part of the worldly philosophy is um, never say anything negative to your children, okay? And only say positive things. Well, generally speaking, those that have raised that way are very unprepared for what we call the real world. They're going to get a big dose of real world, and it's not going to go real well. Um, <clears throat> so if our guys can't, uh, could not have taken boot camp, they would not have won World War II. Okay? We would have never been on Iwo Jima if a guy couldn't take boot camp. 
And in boot camp, it ain't about how good they are. It ain't about how much they enjoy their presence. Okay? It's preparing them for something that's ahead. Now, that's a specific thing in a specific time. I don't think life should be a boot camp. I mean, maybe for some, for some of us it would be, but that'd get a little bit old every, you know, every day. Uh, but um, beware of belittling. In other words, every response is just negative. For some people, they fall into that rut. Every response is, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong about this? What's wrong about that? What happens sometimes is those type of parents, they're saying the same thing. They don't even know it. They're saying the same thing about things at church. They're saying the same things about their, their job. Everything is, this is wrong, this is wrong. That, that wears down uh, someone and, 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 and really uh, gets old, and that can um, transfer over to a kid just saying, oh, well, here they go, they're just talking again. Okay. Number eight, beware about when you're discipline, disciplining your children that you say how this is hurting your own reputation. That's an easy thing to do. Yeah, you are really messing up my reputation when you act like that. Okay? Now, <clears throat> there is something, I think, to the family name. Okay? And I think we can use that. Hey, let's, let's do the best we can. Let's, uh, you know, we, we, let, let's, let's, let's bring honor to the family name. That's good. Okay? That's, I don't think anything wrong with that. Uh, but if a child... A young person thinks that the, the, the reason that you want them to live right or do right is because of your reputation, that, um, that's not going to hold up in the long run. The reason we want our kids to do right and the reason we want to raise them right is to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our underlying reason. And if our reasoning is so shallow as that it just affects my reputation, uh, that is going, going to um, be a very selfish concern and uh, probably won't, won't end well. It comes across as though the parent cares more for himself than he does that child getting right and stay, being right in his relationship with, with God, and that bringing joy. Number nine, husbands and wives should not argue in front of the children. Now, um, <clears throat> That's a tricky one sometimes, um, <clears throat> but it should uh, not be that the home is a place where mom and dad are seen to argue. And I do remember one, one time, one or, once or twice, uh, my dad had just started a business. All his money was, was collateral for, for this brand new business. The tensions were high. And I remember seeing my mom and dad argue one time at the table. And uh, I just remember my sister and I going back down the hallway, and we started to whisper to each other. And I said, uh, I'm on dad's side. And she said, but mom's crying. I'm, I'm on mom's side. And we, we can laugh about it now a little bit. Um, but man, that was an unsettled evening for us in that house. You know, some kids grow up, that's all they ever hear. That is all they ever hear. That should not be in a Christian home. That should not be. Um, <clears throat> what that does to um, a child is, is, is very damaging. One man said, marriage um, should never be a duel, it should be a duet. Not, all right, 10 paces. That's not a duet. Now, depending on how well you sing, you might also want to take that duet out of the ears of the children and everyone else as well. Um, but don't duel. Um, even, um, <clears throat> even grandparents, uh, you know, may hear of, uh, or of in-laws may hear of fighting in the home of their children. It's heartbreaking. It's hard to know how to handle that, what to do about that. So let's just understand that is not uh, a way to have a Psalm 128 home that's got the joy in it. Uh, <clears throat> number 10, don't argue with your spouse when you're disciplining a child. 
if mom or dad says, okay, you didn't uh, do this, so now this is going to happen, don't take it up with them right then in front of the children. Okay? That is also something to talk about later. Um, now, if they, if they suggest a time at the firing squad, husbands, you may step in and say, honey, you've been candy selling too long. It's not to that level yet. And uh, let her get in, make her meal that night, <clears throat> and then talk about that later. Lower the weapons. Um, <clears throat> but uh, don't argue with your spouse about that. There needs to be support in the child rearing. There has to be a unity. This is a great thing to get on the same page with before you get married. If you're single, get on the same page with this before you get married. And you need to be specific. You need to find out because I think as days go on, it's more and more surprising how infiltrating the world's philosophy and a rejection of what the Bible says. And a fear to raise kids the way the Bible says has made its way into our, our churches. So take nothing for granted on this. You will regret this. Talking about problems and tensions and disunity in the home, find out after you're married that your spouse has a different philosophy on child rearing than you do. Take all the time necessary to talk through that. Um, it's critical. Number 11, don't spend time bragging on their talents um, as opposed to their character. Okay? Now, <clears throat> often kids will have something that they settle into and they're good at. Uh, for some, there's natural abilities that they capitalize on in certain areas, whether it be art or, or music or sports or things like that. And, and some of those uh, are natural. Others are a, a tendency that they have, but they really work hard to develop that. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, but beware of highlighting that thing that they're the best at as opposed to their, j just their character. And in general, just be beware of showing off our kids in public about what they've done and how good they are and things like that. Now, is there, is there pride in a parent when their kid does well? Yes. But just be careful that that doesn't become what's done uh, in public so much so that the kid thinks that's what makes you happy or that's where they've really made it or they've pleased, they've, they've, they've made it now because of this thing that they do or this, this accomplishment that they had. Um, again, we, we want to go back to the idea that what's going what's gonna to establish our homes and our kids for the long term for God is that they have a personal walk with God. And nowhere in the Bible is that ever something that we're bragging about. In fact, we read about that this morning or yesterday in our family devotion time about the long robes that the scribes wanted. They wanted the greetings in the marketplace. They wanted to have this, the best seat in public. They wanted to be recognized uh, for who they were, what they did, but not as a result of their personal relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So be careful about um, that. That can bring in a pride and a sense of I'm, I'm okay because I did this, uh, when in reality um, we need to be developing their, um, their walk with the Lord and making that the main thing. Now, we're going to have an awards program for this and that, and we're going to recognize things uh, that kids have done uh, throughout the course of school and church and things. And that's okay. That's good. All right? <clears throat> but it just needs to be, like everything else in our life, put in its proper place and, and maintained there. Uh, number 12, watch letting the television or the radio play constantly. Okay? That TV is on, all right? There's whatever you're watching, but then there's the commercials, okay? All right? Uh, the radio's on. Be careful, all right? I understand what we believe, uh, uh, what we believe the Bible teaches uh, about music, but just 
make sure you hold to that. Don't let that slip. Uh, <clears throat> the music and the television, that's going to yeah, that's going to infiltrate our homes and create an environment of either spirituality or a worldliness. So the music we pick can create an, an, an aura, an, an environment, a setting. So let's fill our homes with the good music and the right music and proper music and uh, bring peace into our children's heart, not stir up the world, or stir up the flesh. That's stirred up. And so watch... We have to be careful with our media and what we bring before our kids. Uh, number 13, watch being careless with cell phones. Okay, watch being careless with cell phones. So uh, at some point, many young people, get, they get a, most young people get a cell phone. And often at the very start, a parent's very careful about that. And any parent that just hands the kid the cell phone and says, okay, it's yours now and doesn't take basic precautions, they don't, they don't care about the spirituality of their kids. I mean, they may have done it naively, but sorry, if there's, if there's zero thought about what that cell phone is and means and can do, there is, there is no care about the spirituality of, of, of our kids. Uh, secular psychiatrists and psychologists even say that. But we have to be careful as this, is when a year or two passes and maybe then they go off to college or they relocate or something like that, who's their accountability person? Who's the person that they say, hey, throw me your phone? They throw it right away to them, not in the garbage, right away to them and they look anywhere on it. Who's that person for our kids? Sometimes we have people that are here, and then maybe they leave here, and they're somewhere else. And I think it'd be good if that transition goes, well, that's the parent. That's dad or mom. And then when a person gets married, then that's their spouse. Anytime. Hey, throw me your phone. There it is. Okay. Um, what about the transition time, though? Uh, maybe we, they got their phone, kind of were really careful at the first, and now a year or two has passed. Now they have this text group that they're a part of. Some of the people in the text group they're a part of went to high school with them, but they're not here now. Maybe they're not around their dad or their original accountability person, and maybe they're kind of out from underneath the authority. Maybe they shouldn't be, but they're still in your kids, still in their text group. Well, here's the boy, here's the, here's the kid. This is all any of us, really, but here they are, and phew, all these thoughts are going to be coming in. All these influences are going to be shooting in at them. Okay. We've got to ask, who, who, who gets your phone? Who checks your phone? Who's, 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 who are you accountable uh, there to for your phone? Well, yeah, I'm not at home anymore. I'm 19. I'm on my own. I didn't ask that. Who's your person that says, yeah, I'll take a look at your phone. Well, it's just some guy. Who's this guy? Who is that? Well, you know, I think dads, if we ask enough questions, we might find out, say, you know what? That person's really, they're not married. They're not here. I don't know about them. Maybe we should hop out of that text group. We can meet face-to-face -face if you want. No problem with that. We can go to McDonald's and the three of us, me, you, and your friend, we're glad to meet face-to-face. -face. That's no problem. But I don't really know what's going on. I'm going to play this one safe. So I'm just going to say, from age 18 until they get married, really think about that phone. And we can't take it for granted. Okay? Somebody needs to be, they, they, we owe it to them to stay, them to stay accountable to us. Owe that to them. Don't be careless. The world the entire world is in the palm of their hand. We know it, right? We know it. But well, it's going to take some work. Um, <clears throat> number 14, teach kids not to be afraid of things. <laughs> not to be afraid. Oh, they're afraid of storms, afraid of dogs, afraid of this and that and their whole life, and they're just afraid of everything. Do your best as much as possible as your kids are growing up. Teach them not to be afraid. They fall down. Oh, they fall down. They're running real hard and they fall down. And you've seen the two opposite reactions. Generally, the kid will look up 
And if there's fear on the parent's face, the kid will let out the whale. Kid falls down, we look, leg seems to be in, you know, knees not hanging out, you know, on the other side of the road or anything like that. You get scraped up. They say, oh, good one. Come on now, let's hop up. Kid, a little tougher as a result of that. So he actually gets a little tougher than a little more scared about everything. And everything's a big deal. We've got to face our fears. Okay, um, you know, David and Goliath didn't start out as David and Goliath. Started out as David versus a bear. I might take Goliath over a bear, frankly. I don't know if Goliath's fingernails could, you know, do that thing that the bears could. And it's David versus a lion. Well, somewhere along the line, Jesse, I don't think when David tripped and fell, oh, David, it, he, I don't think so. Because he's not fighting a bear and a lion, much less Goliath. Maybe Saul's dad did. I don't know. Saul's tall, big tall guy, right? Scared. It'd be a funny thing, isn't it? Head and shoulders, and he's the scared guy. He's the tall guy. He's the scared one. David's a little, I think he's just we're taught not to be afraid of things. Uh, within reason. <laughs> within reason. Number 15, always take time to listen and talk. Always take time to listen and talk. We give our kids plenty of time to listen and talk. Uh, they'll continue that through their, through their teenage years. They really need that, time to listen and talk. I keep, I keep this little vehicle in my office right there. Now, I know that's causing a lot of you to say, wow, don't covet over this thing. Okay, don't covet. That is a smooth machine. Notice, notice that this is the trunk. That's where the spare is at. That's the bonnet. And back here, back in the back is the engine. That car sold for a smooth $1,800 in the winter of 1972. The reason I know that is because a couple weeks after I was born, my dad went and bought that car, Baby Blue, from a dealership in Joppatown, Maryland. And on Christmas Day, according to my parents, I, I got on to them about this. He says, Christmas Day, you know, I was you know, about a month and a half old. And they said, oh man, that day, you should have seen your dad. He was just looking out the window, the snow was coming down lightly. And uh, he was just looking out the window at that brand new Volkswagen Super Beetle that he just bought. I'm kind of like, I'm here. I mean, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm a human. I'm a little human. Can, but I, no, I, so I kind of got it from my dad, this car thing. And like, oh yeah, there's a kid over there. But man, that car. Well, that's the car that we had, and I, I, put, I leave that in my office, and uh, what, what it reminds me about is the many, many, I can't tell you how many hours that uh, my dad sat in the driver's seat and I sat in the passenger seat. If it was winter, the co-pilot in that car had a big job. He had the scraper, and he would scrape the inside of the window because there was no defrost. So he's busy scraping the inside. Down comes this little frost onto our laps, and we're toughing it out. Of course, the windshield's like right there anyway. So you're, it's not hard, you're like this. <laughs> but you were busy if you were the passenger in that car. There was zero heat, well, well, there was a knob that said heat, but when you moved it over, it laughed at you. This German Volkswagen Beetle laugh. It was very, um, kind of like Third Reich style laugh. It wasn't, wasn't a good laugh. It laughed at you when you turned the heat on. Oh, and then the seat covers were awesome. They were made out of uh, vinyl, steel, a steel vinyl combo that had these, like, um, these uh, medieval torture chairs. You've seen them where you sit and there's spikes coming out of them. That's what you sat in. And then you took your life in your hand if you fell asleep in one of those cars because you'd lay over on that seat. You'd wake up like an hour later and you would pull your skin up and you'd have like a five hour tattoo f from what you did sleeping in one of those cars. So you pretty much stayed awake uh, anyway. Well, the engine was loud enough. It was kind of hard to fall asleep anyway, but 
I always spent uh, many hours together in that car. Uh, he had two businesses, and they were about three hours apart from each other. And so in the summertime, he'd be at one business for three days and the other business for the other three. And I got to ride with him in that car three hours. Early Monday morning, off we go to Beckley. Down there, and then he'd come back Wednesday for church, back in the car. Me and him, hours, hours. And you know what we talked about? I tried to remember, and I came up with this conclusion. We talked about a whole lot of nothing. I have no idea what we talked about. There was no, all right, son, we're going to go over this list right now. Number one, small letter A, are you taking notes? <laughs> there was none of that. We sometimes didn't talk a lot. But I spent a lot of time together, a lot of time just talking, just he and I. And, um, oh, man, I sometimes wonder, what, what did he have to say to that goofy, goofy eight-year-old? Well, it didn't really matter. It's just time, a lot to talk about. And as time got, went on, he has just established that. It's not about what you're talking about. It's just, just going, an opportunity to talk and to, and, and, and to be together. I'm very grateful for those. You know, the Lord gives us those opportunities with him too as our father, right? He gives us plenty of time to sit in. I don't think he would have a sit in a Volkswagen Beetle, but he gives us plenty of time, if we'll take it, to talk with him as much as we want to. And we need that. Just like I really needed that, and that really was helpful, and that was really special for me. The Lord's right there, too. He has all the time in the world. If we'll get out of our rush, hustle to this, that, the other, and uh, live our Martha life, hurry, scurry. He tells us Mary, Mary sat at the feet. She, she She had it down. So take time to listen and talk. Uninterrupted listening. It's important for kids. It's important for husbands and wives. Same way. Very important for husbands and wives. Time. You can't, can't speed that up. Okay, you can listen to your teachers on one and a half times college students. Shame on you. I saw myself teaching on somebody's screen the other day. It was like this. <laughs> All done. Multiple choice on the test anyway, it ain't going to be that hard. Uh, that's going to work real well with kids and definitely going to work real well with your wife. Good luck. Try that out. Let me know how that goes. Hey, hon, I'm going to listen to you at double speed, so speed it up. They love that. Oh, man. It's, guy told me to do it one time. I'm going to try it, see how it goes. Time. Number, uh, last couple things here, then we'll, we'll close. Number 16, don't be a dual personality parent. That idea of, it's church time, now we're like this. Oh, it's at home, now we're like this. Don't be like that. That's, the Bible calls that hypocrisy. Uh, and a hypocrite, the words somebody that puts on a mask. Just, just be yourself. Just be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. That's the worst thing probably we could do, is try to be two, two people. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, number 17, don't complain and criticize. That just was the dagger for the Old Testament uh, children of God. It's a stern warning to the church of Philippi. Do all things without murmurings and, and, and disputings. Don't complain and criticize. That will sink right down into not just the soul of the person that's the criticizer. It'll sink right down into the soul of, of the kids that hear it, especially if it's about uh, someone that's their teacher uh, or uh, their, their preacher, their youth pastor, that'll sink down into their soul. That's very hard to eradicate once it's given out. So let's be careful for complaining and criticizing. All right, so let's uh, look back again, if we could, at Psalm 128, and we'll read this one last time. Psalm 128. A lot of Bible verses, just for the sake of time, I can turn to, but um, I want to read this here in closing. Psalm 128. Verses 1 through 6. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, 
Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. <clears throat> 